Our co-hosts on this fabulous Friday morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Johnny. Happy Friday. You're on a streak of uh, seven in a row co-hosting, and that's going to reach eight on Monday, by the way. And I believe I'm in on Tuesday because Matt can't be here. That's not. Yeah. This is impressive. Yeah. Uh, with this, John being on every day, have you noticed your ratings going down? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it's going to be one of those kind of days. Okay. Well, I got it. We we spent the last 15, 20 minutes picking on John Gale Scrap, and it just kind of naturally you know, flows over. That's a certain what's theme. We, what's this we stuff, Bill? That doesn't, Rob has. That doesn't happen when Harvey's in here. It doesn't happen when Bodwell's in here. Hmm. Who's the common denominator on... You know, Bill, Bill's feeling his oats here. He came in without a shirt on. He said he did some curls last night. Yep. He wanted to show off the yeah, biceps, yeah, so yeah. he's just kind of... Settling back in now. Yeah, but you made me put my shirt back on, Rob. Well, because they were disappointed everybody on TV. He was talking about cheese curls. That's, that's <laughs> oh, the that's difference. difference. So, yeah, those don't add nearly as much definition. Uh, but uh, they are tasty, though. I'm not going to lie. Our uh, guest in this first segment, before we get to the Friday Five at 835, is Summer Barrett. She is uh, working on behalf of Berkeley County in the state capitol. Summer, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Rob. Hey, you moved it by a minute. <laughs> I did. I said instead of calling it 805, call it 804. Has that thrown everything <laughs> off, hasn't it? it? It really has. So, but, it, it, but I still don't start talking until like 808. So. Cor- that's correct. But <laughs> who's counting? You know, Summer, I, I, I just like to be around you so much. Just the fact that you were holding for an extra minute near me and I could see your light blinking. I just felt better. That, that's how that's how most people feel about me. <laughs> so so here's here's how I think. Okay, so bear me. With, I, I have an hour, about an hour drive in in the in, in the morning, right? So here's what I have a lot of free time. So I'm thinking this is my thought process on the way, right? You're ha- you're having your second kid soon. Yep. Every uh, winter for sixty days, the legislature meets, and you are employed by the county. Your husband is an elected official. So for 60 days, you've got to pick up shop and move to Charleston. As a group, you guys all take the caravan down to Charleston. So what happens when the Barrett children are of school age? Oh, Rob, that's a good question. (laughs) Yeah, this is what I think about when I have free time. You and Jason. You know what? It's one one that weighs heavily on my mind, too. So um, that's to be determined. I'm sure the staff I, of the governor's I, mansion would help them out some, <laughs> right? It's... Yeah. <laughs> how, how old is Berkeley? Berkeley is almost two. He'll be two April 2nd. And they go into kindergarten at what age in Berkeley County? Uh, five. All right, so you got some time. Yeah, yeah. Um, he'll probably go to preschool, so we, yeah. we've probably got two two solid years, maybe three. Well, you've got some decisions to make, young lady. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel yeah, like I'm imposing I, even listening to this kind of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Have you thought about Stubblefield's daycare center? Bill's looking for a second gig yeah. with Tesla stock yeah. down. Check, check with Bonnie on that. <laughs> Bill missed out on that whole NVIDIA run, so. Anyway. It, it is definitely something that gives me anxiety when I think about it, so I try not to. But I think Bill's early. It up first thing this morning. Bill's early chainsaw program for children is. Uh, <laughs> It, it's very successful, John. Well, with really Heights is. legislation, now you can do it. You can actually hire seven-year-olds yeah, to right. operate yeah. chainsaws. But but the cutoff is fourteen. I want to go down to as much as uh, maybe four, five. Keep lobbying they, Heights. They work. They handle chainsaw very well. Heights seems amenable. So <laughs> here I go. All right, Summer. Let's talk now about the Berkeley County priorities, and I want to begin first with the exemption, possible exemption for impact fees for counties that don't have zoning? Yes, this is actually, I think, you know, the reason why I reached out to you and said, hey, I can talk, I can talk about this in some, some greater detail um, because I have, I think I've read the section of code, I don't know, maybe 10 times now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I think there's a little, like, there's a little, there was a confusion in the Senate. We had to clear that up. And now I think, when the, when the bill goes before House go board, we'll have to do the same thing over there. And on the radio the other day, I heard the same sorts of confusion. So um, the only thing this bill does 
is scratch one line out of existing code. So when in the code section that talks about impact fees, they're, I mean, they detail what qualifications you have to have to charge the impact fees, uh, what the fees can be used for, how the fees are determined, um, who the fees can be imposed upon. So it goes into great detail um, wh- how how these fees are, are uh, established and then used. Um, and literally, the, there is one line in the entire code section that this bill would scratch out, and that is the requirement to have a comprehensive zoning plan in your county. Um, there are many other requirements, and I'm trying to find here in the code section what they are. So you have to have population growth in excess of 1% annually, averaged over a five-year period since the last census, or demonstrate a total population rate growth projection of one year per year, like into the future. Uh, You have to adopt a countywide comprehensive plan, and then review that plan at no less than five-year intervals. And then right now, there's the zoning ordinance requirement. There's also a subdivision control ordinance requirement. Um, you have to keep in place a um, formal building permit and review system. And then um, you have to have an improvement program that includes a list of sites with development potential and maintain standards for capital improvements. Uh, which have to be fully or partially funded by the impact fees. So the impact fees can't just go into the county's general revenue budget, for instance, or it can't be used for some other purpose. It has to be earmarked and used for those specific capital improvement projects Mm -hmm. that are detailed in the, the plan that's laid out by the county in advance of charging the impact fee. So... I think there's just a, was a lot of confusion um, thinking this can be charged to everyone that, that buys a new house or builds a new house or, um, you know, it, it can get it just goes into the county general revenue budget. Um, but it's actually very specific in code. And I don't want to ramble on and on and on because I know not everyone cares about those details. But um the, the code section that deals with it is pretty specific. Just one more thing I wanted to mention mm-hmm. before someone asks questions is what the fees can be used for. So the capital improvements that it can be used for are things like water treatment facilities, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, sanitary sewers, stormwater, um, public and uh, primary and secondary school facilities, road systems and right-of-ways, parks and recreational facilities, police, emergency medical, rescue and fire protection facilities. And then there's also a section that says a portion can be used for county services. And then those services are pretty detailed also, like law enforcement and support personnel, street light service, firefighting service, ambulance service. Uh, it even says fire hydrants, roadway maintenance, and public utility systems. So it's pretty specific when it comes to what you can use it for and how it can be implemented or uh, imposed upon people. Summer, so does the school have dibs on that money, a certain percentage of it? So when um, Bill actually asked that the other day, I think Bill, it was Bill, and I thought it did, but then once I went back through, it actually, this section of code does not say that a specific percentage must be used for schools. Um, it just lists uh, primary and secondary schools as something that could be defined as, you know, capital improvements within that uh, overall comprehensive improvement plan. So you may use the funds for the school that it's not a shall, it's a may in that particular case. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't. From what I, I mean, like I said, I've, I've read through it several times and I don't see anything that lays out a percentage or even that any of it has to be used for schools. Is there a formula in place to devise what the impact fee amount would be, or is that simply up to the county? Nope. So that's that's actually part of it also. (laughs) Um, So there's a long detailed section in code that outlines how to determine the proportion of any capital improvement project that a particular development should be responsible for. So 
for instance, you, the, the county couldn't impose a fee upon a new development in Hedgesville and then use that money to build a fire department in South Berkeley County um, because those the, the, the chances of those services being used by the people who are, you know, being subject to that fee would not be benefiting from that service. Same thing with a school or, or whatever. Um, so it says it has to be proportionate to what they're actually going to make use of this improvement project. So you have to identify the project and then that sets the yep. amount and then that amount is made up for by the new development in that subdivision. Yes. Do I have that? Okay. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Uh, some of you sent me that information the other day, and I did read it, so I appreciate it very much. A couple of questions. Uh, one is the uh, uh, the guidelines of how, or more than the guidelines, the instructions how the money can be used, but it's up to the county commission to make that determination. Isn't Is that correct? Sorry, I think I missed the first part. So you're, you're asking the I, determination of how they can be used. Yeah, is, exactly is, right. Yeah, that goes to, but it goes, the money goes to the county commission with some restrictions on how it can be used. But within those boundary conditions, the county commission has a full authority on how the money should be used. Is that correct? Well, yes, but it all has to be detailed in a uh, capital improvement plan before you can ever impose the impact fee. Okay. So like the county couldn't collect these fees and then sit on it for years and or, or months or however long and then say, oh, you know what? Maybe we could build a new school with this. Um, it has to be laid out in advance of actually charging the impact fee. Okay. And I'm going to confuse myself and probably confuse others with the labeling. Uh, right now, the water and sewer district has something that it's called capacity improvement fees or maybe facilities improvement fees. Uh, this it's is capacity, yeah. Okay, this is different than what we're talking about now, uh, the impact yeah. fees. And if the impact fees are approved and are implemented by the county, can the districts continue to exercise the their capacity improvement fees? Yes, because that's their that's their fee structure and that money doesn't go to the county commission and that fee isn't imposed by the county commission so we could have an impact fee and in, in, on top of or in addition to the district's uh capacity improvement fees you could yes okay thank you uh, <clears throat> morning summer this is john uh on the impact fees themselves i understand when a developer comes in and they're going to build 20 homes or 200 homes that that they're the impact fees would apply to them what about the person who's building a house on his back 40 of, of his family property does he pay that they pay impact fees as well so there <laughs> there's a little uh gray area <laughs> The way I read it and interpret it is that that could not happen um, because it talks specifically about having um, subdivision ordinances and um, I'm trying to glance through here and see the specific terminology that they use. Uh, like subdivision plan approval has to be part of the process. Um, so... I, I'm I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> although sometimes down here I feel like maybe I'm. My degree was worth more than the lawyers because I can actually read. Um, oh, but, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Sometimes the lawyers don't seem to be able to read what's written in code. So <laughs> sometimes I'm like, man, that WVU poli sci degree I got did me really good. Taught me how to read. Um, I'm going to say that I don't. I I can't say for sure. Um, but I, I lean toward you could not impose it on someone who's just building a single family home on their own property. It talks a lot about, um, like improvements to property. So like the fees can't be charged to someone who's remodeling or rehabilitating a property of an existing structure, um, and then, but then it does have a caveat that says provided there's no increase in gross floor area. So, like when they were first, when I was first reading this, I was like, oh, the Woolen Mill project would not be able to have an impact fee if if it were in county in the county. And then I was like, oh wait, but it does say 
uh, increase in floor area or dwelling units. So that obviously uh, a project like the rehabilitation of the interwoven mill could be subject to an impact or impact fee. Um, so I, and, I know it's not a great answer, but it seems to kind of be a gray area. And the magnitude um, of the fee, whether it's, char- I don't know, by square footage or however you would charge it, is that also determined by the, the county commissions? Yeah, so so that's, and that's kind of why I feel like a, a person who, like, I don't know, you know, in your in your hypothetical example, I don't know where that property would be, but I know Jason and I own a piece of property that one day we're going to build a home on, and it's off of Poor House Road up against the, the mountain. So, you know, if if we were building one single home there and, you know, around us there's no development being done, there's no large community being built, we couldn't be just, we can't be charged an impact fee just because we're building a home. We have to be, we can, we can only be subject to an impact fee if our development of this home has some uh, proportionate responsibility for the capital improvement projects that the county has laid out in their plan. But if you were Does taking that, that if you were taking that <laughs> same plot of land, let's say it was 100 acres and you're going to stick 60 homes on it, that might qualify them for impact fees. If if that's in an area that they've determined is subject to this capital improvement project. So, if on Poor House Road we were going to build 60 homes and in that area they were looking to build a high school and our development's obviously going to use that high school or benefit from that high school, then we could be subject gotcha. to the impact fee. <laughs> hey, there was a question Erica Roke had on our Facebook page in the comments section, what's the difference between a tax and a fee? And as I understand it from a local uh, standpoint, at least anyway, the school is entitled to, I think, 82% of the taxes that come in, whereas a fee can go straight to the county. The school doesn't get a percentage of the fee, which is the reason why something might be called a fee versus a tax. So I hope that, if and if I'm wrong on that, Bill, or Summer, no, if you I, know the difference. Uh, also, a fee is yeah. a one-off, right? I mean, I've seen, I've seen uh, here in the legislature, they tend to use tax when it's like a straight percentage. So if you're talking about the sales tax it's a six you know six percent of your purchase mm-hmm. um but if you're talking about a hot uh, um i was about to say hotel motel but that's a percentage too um, I'm, I'm, D- DM, fee, dmv fee or something like that yeah it's a flat fee yeah fifty dollars you know it's, it's uh water fee right right yeah summer so, ambulance I, fee I, mean, I don't know if that's like actually yeah. how it's legally defined in code but Summer, we're kind of running out of time, and there's another question, another area I'd like to go to if it's okay. Uh, Senator Tarr has suggested, was going to introduce a bill that would raise the jail fees from about $52 today to around $71, $72 per day. Is that going to take legs? If it does, that's going to be a devastating impact on the counties. Uh, So the bill was in Senate Finance yesterday. Um, they talked about it for maybe 30 minutes. They had um, someone from corrections there. They had someone from the Supreme Court there. Um, and then they just kind of abruptly said they were moving to uh, delay the bill to a future meeting. Um, I think just because, just knowing the political games that are played, I, I don't personally think that the intent of this bill is to actually pass it as it is. Um, I think it's to start some some deeper conversations and to try to find some different ways to pay for the jails. Um, the conversations and the questions that were being asked just lead me to believe that. Um, it also didn't really make sense in the discussion when Corrections was testifying they said that their uh, per inmate daily rate is like $63.05, yet in this bill introduced, it set the per diem, the base per diem rate at 72, like you said, $72 and some odd cents. So I didn't really understand the, the difference in $9. 
Um, I don't know if if this was if the seventy two dollars was literally just you know some arbitrary number they tossed in there, or if there was some uh, research behind it. Um, but it would have kept the bill does keep the three tier system that was put in place last year, um, but it would like structure it differently. Um, so counties who keep their jail bills down would pay a reduced rate, and then counties who don't keep their jail bills down would pay a higher rate. Um, but the answer for, is it going to get legs? I don't think so. There's only two more days left, uh, for committees to pass bills out. And then next Wednesday's crossover day. So, um, I mean, I've seen crazier things take legs, but my, my initial guess would be probably not. Was was the nature that were the nature of the discussions yesterday more an information sort of uh, uh, discussion, or was it actually trying to put some meat on the uh, structural meat on the bones? Uh, it seems like a lot of background information okay. digging um, because they were questioning the Supreme Court, the person who was there from the Supreme Court, about um, what impact he thought the magistrates played in the jail bills and, you know, asking questions about does the county even have any control over those magistrates and their decisions that they make. And um, it it just seemed like uh, a lot of information digging. And and sometimes that's the only way you get someone to testify before your committee and answer questions. So, again, I I don't know. um, I I don't have any inside scoop knowledge about what Senator Tarr's goal of, with the bill is, but it just based on what happened in the meeting yesterday, that's kind of the impression I got. Hey, I might need to uh, lean on you a little these last two weeks, Summer, because uh, the Senate caucus, as you well know, is now from 8 to 10, so I have no access to state senators for the remaining two weeks of this legislative session. I so. don't have any access to anything. Yes, senators. you do. <laughs> <laughs> you got the scoop. You got the inside skinny. I might need some of that intel. <laughs> So, hey, uh, we've got about two minutes. Is there anything else that you're working on for the county that we need to know about that's close to happening or not happening? Um, we're, we're working still on a, a small tweak to a bill that was passed a few years ago. I think I want to say it was 2020. And the only reason I say that is because I remember wearing a mask during it. So mm-hmm. um, I, it, it had to deal with um, fire fees in the county. And um, there was a little, I think we just missed it in the, like, in the drafting process. And when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean a lawyer who drafted the bill. Um, that explains the animosity toward lawyers this morning. <laughs> um, it, it, it made it so the fire board brought a, would bring a request to the county commission to increase, amend the fee, whether they're increasing or decreasing. But most likely it's an increase. Um, and then it would have to go on to the ballot. So it's it said in code the county commission shall place it on the ballot, um, essentially, in, in in more legal terms. But um, obviously that's not – the county commission, and, and I think most members of the legislature, think that uh, a unelected board should not just be able to place things on the ballot with no checks from an elected body. So – the bill would simply change it to say the fire board still initiates the request and then the county commission reviews it and determines whether it will be placed on the ballot. Um, that's it. So it's, it's not a huge fix, but it really does change long term what appears on our on our uh, ballots and, and how those fire fees fire fees can be amended. From Berkeley County's perspective, I think they've always come from the county commission. The uh, uh, the fire board or the ambulance authority makes a present uh, makes a uh, proposal, but the county commission, I think, is the final word. Well, um, with the fire, the fire fee is structured and code completely different mm-hmm. than the ambulance fee. So, the county commission cannot just raise the fee. Um, there's a process by which they have to follow in in it was extremely difficult. I think you had to get like a, a certain percentage of the voters to sign a petition to raise the fee. Um, and, and so in 2020, it was changed to be a ballot referendum. Um, and But in that process of changing it to a ballot referendum was when the 
kind of the terminologies were missed with the shall place on the ballot. And that will do it. No more questions for Summer. Her time is up. <laughs> Thank you, Summer. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Got, Have a great day. She's got kids to attend to. Summer, thank you very much. Have a great day. All right. You too. Bye.